Reverend Jackson, welcome to our program. Thanks for taking the time to Good come to here. You. First thing I want to ask you this morning, the Federal Election Commission in Washington ruled six to nothing against your campaign in terms of federal matching funds, saying that as of June 21st, you would no longer be getting federal matching funds because you failed to get 10% of the vote in the last three primaries. At, after June 5th, there will be no more primaries. <laughs> so in, the sense, in many ways, it's, it, it's an irrelevant ruling. Uh, secondly, uh, we have 21% of the vote nationally uh, and only 7% of the delegates. And so a very relevant issue will be our cumulative score nationally not just these last few primaries. A third that we expect to get more than 20% of, of the vote uh, in, in primaries on June the 5th. What they ought to rule on more swiftly, however, it's interesting how they have made the ruling on this six to zero so quickly, is the implications of the money spent improperly by Mondale's camp, or uh, perhaps illegally, the relationship between that money and delegates purchased in that process. They had been slow to rule on that matter and that's a matter of great substance that could have tremendous consequences at the convention in San Francisco. Uh, if, in fact, that, that money was tainted and they've not ruled on that, it means the delegates purchased with that money is tainted also. That's critical. In 1952, uh, Taft really had the inside track on, on Eisenhower, but when the tainted delegates were subtracted, the, the, the convention uh, count really went from uh, Taft to Eisenhower. And so given the closeness of this race, the FEC has a much bigger issue to wrestle with on ruling on the validity, validity or invalidity of the money that Mondial got and that which was purchased with it in the, in the delegate process. Okay, getting back to the, to the matching funds question, though, you think that's being un, uh, applied unfairly to you? Well, at this point, it's almost irrelevant because the campaign will be over on June the 5th. Um, I, would, I would challenge them, if, if it came to that, on the grounds of it, that I have received more than 20% of the popular vote nationally and that after all the ruling in the first place was to set up an arrangement whereby a nuisance candidate could not just with any percent uh, keep uh, tying up the detailed bureaucracy of FEC. Clearly our campaign has not been a nuisance cam campaign. It's been one of, of credibility, it's relevant, it's significant and we've gone past the 20 percent line in, in the national campaign. And now it comes to four campaigns left and, uh, and our campaign has momentum. First, we're going to get more than 20% of the vote on, on the 5th, but even if we did not, we would argue our case. Okay, I want to turn to a couple of economic issues. The program we're on right now basically has an audience of business people and investors and so on, and there's a perception in that business community that you are uh, a kind of an anti-business candidate or as a president you wouldn't be uh, good for business. Uh, what leads to that perception, do you think? Well, I do not know. I would challenge a corporate America to bear their share of responsibility in helping to rebuild our nation. I would be for demand side economics as opposed to supply side economics, which is where Hart and Mondale and Reagan are. The idea that somehow corporations are so much more responsible that once they get money, they'll make decisions in the best interest of the nation and they'll reinvest and make our nation strong is not true. Last year, 90,000 corporations made a profit and, and paid no taxes. When they made these huge profits, and some of them in the auto industry have been downright vulgar, when they made those huge profits, they then either merged with other companies or acquired other companies uh, and replaced people with machines without adequate time uh, in the business transaction for the human transition. Uh, many of them closed plants on workers without notice. A lot of workers out of the plant and then shifted our job to South Africa, Haiti, Taiwan, and slave labor markets abroad. I don't think that's right. I would be for the major tax break as an incentive to corporations, but they would then have the obligation to reinvest in this economy, retrain this workforce, and reindustrialize our nation. That would make us strong from the inside out. Therefore, we could be on the offense and compete and not be on the defense, ducking and dodging behind content legislation. You know, even a honeybee, which really is a natural process, gets nectar from a flower gets its, its gratification, its joy, its wholesomeness, its life from that flower, that honeybee then drops pollen who had picked up nectar. Because when the honeybee flies away, if he did not drop nectar, the flower would die. When the honeybee would return, the honeybee would not live because the flower would be dead. When these corporations get their nectar from the American economy, their security, uh, their tax breaks, their, their loans, uh, and their workforce, and their consumer market, and then so their pollen in Haiti, Taiwan, and South Korea, 
they kill the flower. So I'm asking for corporate integrity. Lastly, I just left the Navajo Reservation in New Mexico uh, yesterday, and there are workers, the, the first 29 Navajos that went to work in the uranium mines, 23 died from cancer. The remaining six are dying of terminal cancer. And so a corporation, the extent to which they have poisoned our air and contaminated our water, and they're responsible to put toxic waste dumps around the country and made acid of our rain, they have engaged in a kind of chemical warfare against the American people. I'm all for corporations being strong, but for having integrity and being accountable. Okay, Reverend Jackson, let's, let's talk about the beehive in San Francisco in July. Uh, most people view the, the, the strength you have as really what you'll be able to get out of, say, a Mr. Mondale or a Mr. Hart when we get down to the Democratic Convention, assuming that's it's how... It's not my perception. No, I understand. Assuming that's how it turns out. You will clearly come there with a great deal of influence and a very strong constituency. Can you just give us a little idea as to the scenario? How do you expect to exercise that influence, again, as related to the economic issues you've been talking about? Well, first one must measure the influence in several areas. One, we have uh, won 53 congressional districts. 30 across the South where progressives have never won before. And therefore, we could very well change the face of the U.S. Congress, which would be a kind of institutional shift in our country. When blacks vote in great numbers, Hispanics also win. We got the right to vote at the same time. We'll have our right to vote protected at the same time. If blacks vote in great numbers, women win. ERA will never pass unless blacks and Hispanics are enfranchised. You'll never get adequate child care legislation unless women are enfranchised. Among other reasons, 70% of all poor children live in a house headed by a woman where there is no man. But if, in fact, blacks and Hispanics and Asians and women are brought into the workforce with, with uh, proper protection, you'll end right to work laws, which would have a tremendous impact upon businesses, particularly with some businesses shifting uh, from, from states in the northeast going to where you have right to work laws, for example. So I put a lot of focus on voter rights enforcement or empowering the poor as opposed to aid our focus on trade, as opposed to focusing on embellishing the poor, I choose to fight to empower the poor. And so the issue of winning 53 congressional districts is important. Next, we've won uh, more than two and a half million popular votes, and that's critical. More than 300 delegates so far, and that's critical. And the margin of victory in key uh, state, uh, county, uh, and federal elections, so that the influence of the Rainbow Coalition is substantial. Our concern is to expand our party and heal our party. We have the challenge now, Mundell and, and Labor combined, uh, to set up some rules that they said very openly were stacked against the long shots. Who are the long shots? A Southern is a long shot. A woman is a long shot. A black is a long shot. Hispanic, Asian, all these are long shots. The result is uh, Mundell now has about 40% of the popular vote, but about 50% of the delegates. He has more delegates than the popular vote has earned him. I have 21% of the popular vote, 7% of the delegates. I have few than I have earned. So a critical factor would be to expand the party rules so as to make room for new Democrats. We've got 15% of the vote in Arizona and no delegates. That's disenfranchising too many people. 15% in Vermont and no delegates. So that will be critical. A second concern we will have, however, will be to in fact begin to fight for a tax structure They'll begin to shift the, the incentives to people who are going to spend the money. I mean, when the very wealthy get the money, they tend not to buy washing machines and ironing board and clothes. They buy expensive jewelry and, and paintings and they hoard their capital. And I'm convinced that the trickle down of supply side from the top down does not work nearly as well as a centrifugal force from the bottom up. And I'll be fighting for a shift, therefore, in how we uh, make available our wealth in this country. Okay, I'd like to ask you about a lot more, but we're out of time. Thanks so much for being here, and, and good luck to you. Thank you very much. And I'm going to turn you over to Clarence.